Good evening, everybody, and Chodesh Tov. I hope you are all doing well. As I've mentioned uh, to some of my Shi'ur groups in the past, if I'm wearing a white shirt on a weekday, it means one of a few things. It means I'm attending a life cycle event that day, or it means I'm behind on laundry, or it means that it's Rosh Chodesh. So Baruch Hashem, it's, I'm not behind on laundry, and tonight is once again going to be Rosh Chodesh as we commence the month of Elul. And so this evening, I'd like to look at a section in this week's parasha, which I believe contains within it important messages for our lives in general, but in particular, as we commence the month of Elul, and I'll be concluding the Shi'ur, tying in what we're going to be learning today with this new month. Tonight's Shi'ur is dedicated by Agi Bankir in memory of her father, Avram Yaakov ben David Zichrono Livracha. Agi is not currently watching the Shi'ur because she is on a plane or in transit somewhere on the way to Israel to make Aliyah together with Leon, but she's going to see the recording of this Shi'ur. So, Agi and Leon, once again, Mazal Tov to you, and we wish you Arichut Yamim, and thank you very much for dedicating this Shi'ur. This evening, I'd like to focus on one section in this week's parasha, which is a really fascinating section, I believe, to consider and to imagine if this was a movie scene and this is what's taking place. The context once again in the book of Dvarim is that Moshe Rabbeinu is a few weeks before passing away. He recalls the highs and lows of our times in the Midbar and he prepares us for our new life without him in the land of Israel. And in that context we have a section describing what we should do when we go to war. Next week's parasha will be called Ki Seila Milchama when you go out to war. But already in this week's parasha, we talk about preparations for war. And in that context, we read source number one. When you go out to war against your enemy, and you're going to see horses and chariots and many more people than you. The message is, do not fear them. Hashem is with you, Hamalcha Me'eret Mitzrayim. This is Hashem who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Don't be afraid of these horses and chariots and the people. Everything will be okay. And what message is going to be delivered to the people? V'haya, and it should be. Kekorvachem el hamilchama, when you approach this war, v'nigash ha-kohen v'diber el ha'am, the kohen will approach and speak to the people. So let's remember the speaking parts in this play. Now the Kohen steps up and the Kohen says as follows, Va'amar alehem, and he says unto them, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. Atem kravim hayom lemilchama aloi vechem. Today you're approaching war against your enemies. Al yeirach levavchem. Let your hearts not feel faint. Al tira'u, fear not. Va'al tach bazu, do not be alarmed. And do not be frightened by them. Four ways of saying the same thing. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Why not? Amazingly in the Torah, it doesn't say even Omar Amen. The Pasuk is because the Lord your God walks before you. He fights for you with your enemies in order to save you. You have Hashem, not only by your side, but going ahead of you to lead you into battle. Do not be afraid. This is where the Kohen now steps aside and the Shotrim, the bureaucrats now take over. And the officers come along and they make certain announcements to the people. The Shotrim would come along and they'd say to the people as follows. Is there anyone here who's built a new house and hasn't yet dedicated, inaugurated, consecrated his house? You can go home. Just in case such a person will die at war and somebody else will um, dedicate his house instead of him. That's category number one. Category number two, the Shotrim would announce. Who over here has planted a vineyard and not yet enjoyed those fruits? Remember, we're in the 
desert at the moment. None of us own vineyards. We're imagining we're in this land and they're talking about vineyards. But if you've planted a vineyard and you haven't yet eaten from that fruit, go home. In case you die at war and somebody else eats of those fruits. Category number three. Is there anybody here who has betrothed a woman and not yet taken her? Go home once more. In case you die at war and someone else takes her. And now we have category number four. And category number four is clearly separated from the previous three categories because category number four is introduced with the words, hashotrim el ha'am. And then the officers would continue, they would add on to speak to the people. So it's almost as if we don't have four categories of people who are exempt from military action. We have three plus one. What is this plus one? Va'amru, they would say, Mi ha'ish Who's scared? Who's faint-hearted? Go home. Do not melt the hearts of your brethren like your heart. Which is a strange concept to consider for numerous reasons, and we're going to be asking those questions soon when we consider this in greater detail. Now, there are two Mishnayot I'd like to share with you, which expand the understanding of that which is taking place here. The first Mishnah in source number two expands on the pep talk, that encouraging talk that the Kohen would give to the people before going out to war, that battle cry. And the Mishnah builds up and explains that battle cry. Remember the Kohen said in four different ways, don't be scared. And the Mishnah in source number two fills in the details and it says, Ali don't be faint hearted. Why would you be faint hearted? because of the neighing of the horses, and the sharpening of the swords. Al tira fear not. What might you fear? because of the knocking of the shields, v'shapat hakalagsin and the noise of the boots. Al techbazu, do not be alarmed. Mikol kranot from the sound of the horns. Al ta'artzu, do not be frightened. Because of the shouting. So you're coming ahead of all the shouting and noise and all these different terrifying things. Don't be scared. Because Hashem is the one who's going with you. Your enemies are championing flesh and blood. But you champion Hashem. As we've seen in history, Plishtim Ba'u B'nitzchonosh El Goliath, the Plishtim came along confident, championing the fact that they had Goliath, Mahayasa Fawa. What happened there? Lesof Nafal Becherev Nafloi Mor, he fell and they fell with him. B'nai Amon Ba'u B'nitzchonosh El Shovach, the B'nai Amon were very excited there at Shobach, Mahayasa Fawa. What happened there? Lesof Nafal Becherev Nafloi Mor, he fell, they fell. But when you go out to battle, don't be like that. Hashem is the one who goes together with you to fight for you in order to save you. When we go to war, it is very, very different. Now, as we said before, there are four categories of people here, three plus one. And our focus this evening is going to be on category number four, the plus one. The coward, the person who was scared, the faint-hearted person who's told to go home. Because in source number three, a different Mishnah in Sota, there are three different opinions as to who this person was, who exactly is exempt from war. And we could ask a question against each of these opinions. In source number three in the Mishnah, we're told, Rabbi Akiva, Omer Rabbi Akiva says, Hayarev rachalevav, the coward, the scared person, kamash We have to understand this literally. Someone who cannot possibly stand there at war and to see a drawn sword. If there's somebody who cannot stand that experience, just go home. That's what Rabbi Akiva says. And I'd like to ask a question against Rabbi Akiva. Who would not be scared? 
before going to war. You're about to go to battle. There are horses, there are chariots, there's the sound of shields and boots and shouting, and there, they've got more people than you. And objectively speaking, with the facts on the ground, they're stronger than you. Who wouldn't be a little bit scared at that moment? Surely, if this is literal, when they stand up and say, if there's anybody who's scared, go home. At that point, wouldn't every single person turn around and go home? What does it mean the person who's scared? Who are we talking about, according to Rebbe Akiva, if this is to be taken literally? The second opinion is the opinion of Rebbe Yossi Haglili. And he says, who are we talking about? This is somebody who's scared, not because of their weak heart or that they can't possibly see blood. They are scared because they have done transgressions. They've done Averot. And therefore the person's thinking, how can I go to war if I've done Averot? I can't do this. I'm a vulnerability for our nation. And then Rabbi Yossi Glili says something amazing. He says, The Torah, because of this category number four, created three other categories for the sake of this one person. What's the concern? If you say, will all cowards please turn around and go home? What kind of coward would turn around and go home with everybody watching them? Why would a coward do that and experience that if they're a coward? And other than the problem that it takes cowardice to admit your cowardice, this is a very embarrassing thing. This person has sinned. They're turning home because they've done bad things in their lives, which are so terrible and so shocking that they think that Am Yisrael might lose a war because of their behavior, because they are in the ranks of Am Yisrael. How humiliating would it be for such a person to turn around and go home? And Sarah so Biyosi Aglili says that the Torah invents three other categories. Vineyard, house, engaged but not yet married. Let all those people go home. So if you see somebody turn around and go home, you don't think, ah, oh, that's a sinner. You think, ah, oh, very nice. I didn't hear that he got engaged or, ah, oh, I didn't realize he was getting involved in the wine industry or how lovely he must have just built a new house. You would have no re idea why this person was going home. And here we see an example of the extent to which the Torah cares for human dignity. And whose dignity is the Torah concerned about here? The Torah is concerned about the dignity of the sinner. The Torah is concerned about the dignity of somebody who's done something which is so terrible that Am Yisrael could lose at war because of this individual. If this is the care that we have to show for the experiences and emotions of the sinner, Kal should we care for the dignity of every single human being? So that's the opinion of Rabbi Yossi Haglili, that the coward is somebody who, it's not just cowardice, it's not a faint heart, it's somebody who has behaved in a terrible way and therefore needs to go home. Rabbi Yossi Omer, now we have opinion number three. And the question we need to ask against opinion number two is, what kind of sins are we talking about? I asked my son earlier today when we were out on a walk, you know, what sin could we be talking about? And he says, oh, it must be murder. They must have performed murder. But if it's murder, then either they've been killed or they're in an ear miklat, so it can't be murder, but it must be something terrible. So what sins are we talking about? We now have opinion number three. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi says, Almana lakohen gadol, grusha v'chalotza lakohen ediot, Mamzeret unetinali Israel, Bat Israel a Mamzer unetin. Rabbi Yossi lists a long list of forbidden relationships. Somebody who has engaged in one of these forbidden relationships, somebody who you're not allowed to marry for whatever reason. Harehu That is who we are talking about. And the question we need to ask against Rabbi Yossi in opinion number three is: How are you any different from opinion number two? Opinion number two says you've done averot. Opinion number three, Rabbi Yossi gives us a list of Averot. So what's the difference between them? And now we're going to continue and develop this understanding based on the Gemara in source number four, before we come back to opinion number one. Because the Gemara starts off by asking our final question. My Ikab ben Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi Aglili, what's the difference between opinion number three and opinion number two? Ikab ben Ayu, there's a difference between them, which is Avera de Rabbanan. If all you've done is a rabbinic sin as opposed to a biblical sin. So the Gemara explains as follows. Opinion number one is Rebbe Akiva, that you're just a coward, literally. 
Opinion number two, Rabbi Yossi Aglili, is that you've even done a rabbinic sin. Opinion number three, Rabbi Yossi, he lists biblical sins, things which on a, are on a higher level. So it appears that in opinion number two, according to Rabbi Yossi Haglili, the bar is a bit lower than it is for opinion number three. But how low does the bar go for opinion number two? We then have the following statement in the Gemara. Kaman as lahadatanya. Who does the following Tanaic statement go like? Because we have a teaching which is sach bein tefillah lit tefillah. That word sach is sometimes spelled with a sin and sometimes spelled with a samach, depending on the source. If somebody talks between one tefillah and another tefillah, Averahi beyado, that's an Avera in your hand, and you're one of the people who turns back. There's an opinion that if you talk between one tefillah and another tefillah, that is the sin we're talking about, that because of that sin, you have to turn around and go home. Who holds like that? The Gemara says, well, it's not opinion number one. I'm just adding in words to the Gemara here, because that's literal. It's not opinion number three, that has to be biblical. Kaman, Rabbi Yossi Haglili, is like opinion number two. It appears that according to Rabbi Yossi Haglili, all you have to have done wrong is speak between one tefillah and another tefillah, which for now, let's understand that as talking in shul. That is such a terrible sin that you have to turn around and go home because maybe Am Yisrael will lose at a war because of your conduct. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, speaking in shul is a bad thing. Recently, the decorum has been much improved. But in general, it's not a good thing to talk in shul. However, is it so terrible that Am Yisrael might lose a war because of one individual who turned around to somebody and said something between one tefillah and another? How are we to understand Rabbi Yossi Haglili, which is really a question of how are we to understand the identity of the coward in this week's parasha? So let's start with Rabbi Akiva, the first of the three opinions, because that's the easiest one to understand. Ramban tells us about Rabbi Akiva, and he says as follows. Va'aldad Rabbi Akiva, who can mashma'o Rabbi Akiva, says this literally. Well, how can we understand Rabbi Akiva? Ki mi kohen. Once the kohen has stood up, and he's delivered his motivational speech, and he said to us, Hashem is with you. Hashem took you out of Mitzrayim. Don't be scared. Don't be alarmed. Fear not. Don't be frightful. If you've heard those words and you've been given the promise of Hashem's salvation and you're still scared, there's something lacking in your faith in Hashem. And therefore, you're not going to receive any miraculous victory. Ramban explains that cowardice under this circumstance shows a lack of faith in Hashem, a lack of belief in Hashem, because you've just been told by the Kohen that Hashem's going to win this war for you. If you're still scared, there's something lacking in your religious world. There's something lacking in your connection with Hashem. That's why you have to go home. And then Ramban says, who's a gentle-hearted person, that's talking about somebody who literally cannot take murder. They can't see blood. They can't handle it. And therefore, so we actually have two categories here. There's the one who lacks fear in Hashem, the lacks belief in Hashem. That's the one who's scared. We send him home because he lacks faith in Hashem. And there's also this person who literally cannot take blood. Such a person is no use to Am Yisrael at battle. Ki anutal, either run away or yet left or faint. We don't need that person. So to answer the question that we asked against Rabbi Akiva, wouldn't everybody be scared when you go to war? The answer is, yes, everybody can be a bit fearful. But if you've been promised Hashem's salvation and you're still terrified, there's something missing in your relationship with Hashem. Let's move on to opinion number two, Rabbi Yossi Haglili. Sach bein tefillah litfila. Because according to Hagahod Maimonot, source number six, we're talking about two tefillot in particular. We learn in the Yerushalmi, Hamesaper ben Yishtabach leyotzer, or if you talk between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu, which is the opening bracha of Yotzer Or. So if you talk between the end of Sukkot to Zimra and the beginning of the next prayer, Averahu biyado v'chozer alem marchei melchama. That is an Averah and you have to go home because of it. 
ולכך נהגו לו מה ישתבח מועמד. הנהגות מימוניות explains, this is why we stand up for ישתבח. Why do we stand up for ישתבח? The answer is, כמו יוצר, because we're about to stand up for ברוך הוא, שהרי אסור להפסיק בינתיים, because you can't have a break between ישתבח and ברוך הוא. So we stand up for Yishtabach in preparation for Baruch Hu to make sure that we can go straight through. And therefore there's an opinion that Tfilah le Tfilah means you can't talk, you can't have a separation between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu. It's a question against our minhag, which we're going to start in one month's time, of adding in Shira Ma'alot between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu, where lots of people ask the question, and lots of people give the same answer, Saruch Iyun, good question. Either way, we shouldn't really have anything interrupting between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu. And the Orach Hayim explains why this is such a terrible thing. Because he says in source number seven, Mia Ish Hayareh, etc., we're told in the Gemara, this is somebody who has to go home. Why? If somebody has behaved in a bad way, even if they are unaware of their behavior, the fear which enters your heart at a time of war will inform you that there's something going wrong here. And our sages gave us a way to measure this fear and to know what level of transgression we're talking about. If all you did was speak between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu, you have to go home. Why? V'hata'am, the reason is, ki ha'nichnas l'milchama tzarich la'asot lo neis l'hinatzel mecherev oyev. We have to understand that when we're going to war, in order to win that war, what we need is a miracle. V'chol shebi adom ibchinat hara, but if you have this bad quality in you, e'nora o'ila nes, you're not deserving of a miracle, or mazalo yachido, and therefore your mazal is going to scare you and put you off. What the Orachayim is describing is as follows. When Am Yisrael goes to war, it's not that if somebody's done something terribly wrong, he'll be punished or we'll all be punished. The way that Am Yisrael wins at war is with Hashem's intervention and with Hashem's guidance and His providence. That's what we're told. Hashem is about to come in with you to war. And therefore, if you've sinned and there's something lacking in your relationship with Hashem, then there's a concern that you're not going to be deserving of that miracle. There's a very, very high bar for deserving of a miracle. To get a miracle from Hashem, you either have to be a brilliant person or a terrible person. Because a miracle is a change in the natural order of the world. If you're a brilliant person, Hashem might do a miracle for you. If you're a Korach, Hashem might do a miracle for you. But for the rest of us in the middle, to actually expect to go to war and deserve Hashem's miracle will take a lot. And therefore, all it takes is a small misgiving, a small sin, something small like talking between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu, in order to say that maybe you're not deserving of that miracle. And before we move on to a different approach, I want to let you know that in case you think this is just story time and talking in shul and it's not such a big deal, this is codified in the Shulchan Aruch in Orachayim Hilchot Birkot HaShachar Simanu Dalet Sa'ev Gimel, where he says in source number eight, HaMesaper BeNishtabach LiYotzer, if you talk between this tefillah and the other tefillah, Aveira Hi BeYado, it's an Aveira in your hand, and you return from the battlefield because of this. It is in the Shulchan Aruch that if you have spoken in Shud at this time, you don't go to war. Somebody just asked, Lawrence, you asked how this applies to the IDF. I think at the Bakum or in your Tzav Rishon, when you're first called up to the army and they quiz you, maybe this needs to be one of the questions that you're asked. You know, they should ask, by the way, have you ever spoken between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu? This could actually be an amazing way for soldiers to get exemptions from the army. You just have to talk between Yishtabach and Baruch Hu, and uh, what can you do? I can't go to war anymore. It's a sacrifice, you know, taking one for the team. And then you can go back to Yeshiva. Anyway, on a serious note, how does this impact the IDF? It impacts the way we understand the role of the IDF, and that a Jewish army fighting in the Jewish homeland has to understand that we're hoping that Hashem's going to help us. We're not relying on Hashem's miracles. And we're not going to war thinking that Hashem's going to miraculously save us. We have to do everything that we possibly can 
But at the same time, we have to make sure that we as an army are as moral as we possibly can be and as ethical as we possibly can be. And we have to hope that our army camps are camps which are deserving of Hashem's presence, a place where Hashem can feel comfortable to be in our presence in order to help us. So that's the end of this approach to Sach Ben Tfila that is talking about talking in Shul. But the reality is that the phrase Sach Ben Tfila appears in another Gemara. And the term Sach Ben Tfila in the other Gemara doesn't mean talking in Shul. That's not what it's talking about. What is a tfila? A tfila is the singular form of a word that we all know in the plural form, which is tefillin. Tefillin is the plural of one tfila and another tfila. And we wear these two tefillin. And therefore, Rashi explains at the bottom of page two, in source number nine, Sach ben tefila What's the sin that somebody's done, which is so terrible that we have to come back from war? Rashi says, ben hanachat tefillin shel yad litfilin shel rosh. If you've spoken between putting on your tefillin shel yad, the tefillin which goes on the arm, and the tefillin which you put on your head. Now there's a halacha. You're not allowed to talk between putting on the tefillin of your head and the tefillin on your head. You're not allowed to talk then. So there's now that we're saying, what's the sin that you've done? That because of your sin, you don't go to war. Am Yisrael is vulnerable because of you. If you spoke between your shel yad and your shel rosh. And Rashi goes on to say, Averahi biado. Why is that an avera? Well, it's an avera. Imlo chazaru birech. If you didn't repeat the bracha afterwards. This is what we say in the Gemara Menachot. Sach. If you spoke between putting on the two boxes of tefillin, you make two brachot. Losach, if you didn't speak between putting on two boxes of tefillin, you make just one bracha. Now we have to understand that Gemara in brachot, because those of us here who are Ashkenazi will be reading this, and we won't necessarily be familiar with, the, with what's being described here, because we all make two brachot on our tefillin. So, so what's going on here? So on a halachic level, let's just have a little peek in that Gemara, and we're going to come back to an understanding of what on earth has this got to do with a war. Because we have to ask ourselves, not even is this a terrible Avera, we have to ask ourselves, is this actually an Avera at all? Is it actually forbidden to speak between the two boxes of tefillin? Because if we look at source number 10, the Gemara in Nachot, it says, Amar Rav Chista, Rav Chista says, if you speak or have an, introduction, an interruption between one box of tefillin and the other box of tefillin, then you make a second bracha. What do we see? in. If you spoke, then you have to make a second bracha. But if you don't speak, then you just make one bracha. From the Gemara at this stage it appears, it's not forbidden to speak. But if you speak, make a second bracha. So you can make one bracha on tefillin, put on your shel yad, put on your shel, your shel rosh, and off you go. If you happen to speak between the two, make one bracha before the shel yad, and another bracha before the shel rosh. But this isn't an avera, it's not a terrible thing, or even a bad thing at all, according to most opinions. Most understandings in reading this, other than the, raf who, the ran who quotes the balamor, that's what I meant, but anyway. But then we have a source which contradicts this, because there's another source which says, Al tfila shel yad, the box that goes on the hand, Omer the bracha is, Baruch Hashem Tshanu Mitzvotah V'tzivanu, Lehaniach tfilin, to place, to place the tfilin, that's the bracha that you say when it goes on your arm. Al tfilin shel rosh, on the one on your head, Omer you say, Baruch Hashem Tshanu Mitzvotah V'tzivanu, Al mitzvah tfilin, on the mitzvah tfilin. So there's another source which says we have two separate brachot. There's one bracha for the, tfil, for the box which you put on your hands, and one bracha for the box which you put on your heads. We have two separate brachot. And for the ladies amongst us, this is the normal Ashkenazi practice, as we will see. And we say, no, no, no. Abaya barava, the Amra Travayo, Abaya barava, both explain. Losach mevarech achat. We come back to our original rule that in truth, if you don't have any interruption between the two, you only need one bracha. Sach, if you do talk between the two, mevarech shtayim, you need two brachot. So we have a debate here. It's a matter of debate. 
Are you allowed to talk between one box and the other box? And if you did, how many brachot do you make? We're not talking about uh, somebody who's committed murder, someone who's had a forbidden relationship, someone who's done something terrible. We're talking about somebody who's done something, who according to some opinions has done nothing wrong at all. Because if you look at Rashi in source number 11, Sach ben tfila why would that be an Avera? It's an Avera, v'lo birech al shel rosh, if you didn't make the second bracha, that's the Avera we're talking about. But if you did make a second bracha, it's fine. Tosvot in source 12 disagree. Tosvot in source 12, and this will be the final in-depth halachic topic we'll look at before we come back to the world of the general concepts and philosophy here. Tosvot in source number 12 say, Lo sach mevarech achat, sach mevarech shtayim. We said that if you don't talk, you make one bracha. If you do talk, you make two brachot. Now we understood that to mean Pirish Bakundras, Rashi explains, Lo sach mevarech achat, bein shel yad, bein shel rosh. If you don't talk, you make one bracha, which covers both the shel yad and the shel rosh. Sach, if you do talk, mevarech shtayim. You make two separate brachot. One on the one that goes on your arm, and a different bracha on your head. However, Rabbeinu Tam understands this differently. Rabbeinu Tam Piresh, Rabbeinu Tam explains, If you don't talk at all, you make one bracha on your shel rosh. Mevarech al mitzvat tefillin, and the only bracha you make is al mitzvat tefillin, shezol birchato, that's the right bracha. So you make one, if you don't talk at all, you only have to make one bracha on your shell rosh. Sach, if you did talk, mevarech shtayim l'shel rosh, you have to make two brachot on your shell rosh. Laniach v'al mitzvah. So this is the story. You make laniach tefillin on your shell yad. You make a bracha before putting a box on your arm. If you don't say anything, then you make a second bracha on the box on your head, and you've made two brachot, and that's the right number. If you make a bracha on the box in your hand, that's one bracha, and then you talk and you interrupt, then you have to repeat that bracha and say the bracha on your head, so you end up saying three brachot, and that's what you've done wrong here. Either way, let's look at the halacha, just so we know the halacha, but this is a really questionable thing to do, that we're saying that because you've done this, we're going to lose at war. And the halacha is going to help us understand what's going to go- going on here. Because the Shulchan Aruch explains, before even getting to the halacha here, the philosophy of the tefillin. And it tells us what tefillin represent. Because really, if we're to understand this whole concept of going to war and talking between tefillin and going home, we have to understand what these tefillin represent, not just on the technical halachic level of ticking the box of making the bracha on the right box, but what these boxes represent. And so the Shulchan Aruch tells us in Source 13, what should you have in mind when you put on your tefillin? That Hashem told us to place these portions which talk about the unity of Hashem's name and leaving Egypt. When we put on box on our arms, we do it facing the heart, corresponding to the heart. On our head, we're talking about our intellect. The Shulchan Aruch says straight away, we have to understand that we're not just talking about boxes on technical parts of the body. We're talking about the heart and we're talking about the mind. And why are we doing this? We have to remember the incredible miracles Hashem did with us. Which point towards Hashem's unity. And that Hashem is the one who has complete control and dominion upstairs and downstairs, to do whatever he wants. And therefore, what are we doing when we're putting on tefillin? When we put on tefillin, we're saying to Hashem that our soul, which is in our brain, is subservient to him. And our heart, which is about all of our desires and thoughts, that's also dedicated to Hashem. When we put on tefillin, we're saying that our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, our intellects, our emotions, everything is dedicated to you, Hashem. And that's how we're going to remember Hashem, and we're going to reduce our, let's call it hedonism in this world. Now, having given that introduction, 
we see what we do for brachot. And the Shulchan Aruch says, V'yaniach shel yad t'chila, first you put on the one for your hand, V'yavarech l'haniach t'filin, the bracha is l'haniach t'filin. And then the Shulchan Aruch says, V'achar kach yaniach shel rosh v'lo yivarech. Then you put on your shel rosh, and you don't make another bracha. Ki im bracha at l'shtehem, the halacha in the Shulchan Aruch is, there is only one bracha to be said on t'filin. L'haniach t'filin, that's all you have to say. But for the Ashkenazim amongst us, we may be in a majority this evening, Hagar the Ramah goes on to say, Some people say, actually, you make an extra bracha on the head one as well. Even if you didn't interrupt in between. And that is the widespread Ashkenazi custom. That we make two brachot, but you may have noticed that us Ashkenazim do something very unusual after we make the bracha on the tefillin shel rosh. Because stay, straight after we make a bracha on the tefillin shel rosh, what do we say? I, I, I'm assuming we all say this. After making the bracha on the tefillin shel rosh, we say, Baruch. <laughs> Now I've got a problem. I'm not allowed to say those words out loud until it's Yom Kippur. We, we say these words quietly unless, unless we're angels. But it's Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto, and then after that we have the words Le'olam Ve'ed. We say those words after saying the second bracha. And for the Ashkenazim, I don't know if you've ever wondered why we do that. Usually, straight after we make a bracha Le'vatala, we say Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto, which kind of cancels out um, a bad bracha, which you made by mistake. Here, we make a bracha on the Tefillin Shariyad, then we make a second bracha on the tefillin shel rosh, and straight away we say, Baruch Shem. Why do we do that? We do that in deference to the opinion that we actually didn't need to make a bracha on the tefillin shel rosh, because according to the straightforward reading of the Shulchan Aruch, and it appears to be the conclusion of the Gemara in some readings, you only need one bracha. So we make a second bracha to cover that base, and we say, Baruch Shem, to cover the opinion that actually we didn't need to make that bracha. Let, let's leave behind the, the halachic world and we need to ask our question. And our question is, having now viewed and understood the halachic intricacy in, ooh, what word am I thinking of? The halachic details involved over here, we have to ask if you actually spoke between putting on the tefillin shelyad and the tefillin shel rosh, why is that such a terrible thing? Now, some of you I know, print out these source sheets in the afternoon before the shiur. And I know that because I received some questions today, which were, wait a second, you missed out the last page of the source sheet. You finished off the end of page three with the question, why is it so terrible? And then you didn't bring any sources. So shkoyach to those of you who actually looked ahead, saw that and sent me the question, but that was actually the end of the source sheet. I asked the question and I didn't provide an answer because I was still looking for the source to add in over here because the source I was looking for is something I learned from my Rosh Hashiva, Rav Yehuda Amital, Zichrono Levracha. For a while, I was Rav Amital's translator. I've told you in the past I was his whiskey provider, but uh, I had other roles as well. For a while, I was Rav Amital's translator for visiting groups to the yeshiva. So um, I, I picked up that if a group visited the yeshiva and they were to meet Rav Amital, the legendary Rosh Hashiva, he had his go-to Dvar Torah that he would give to them. And um, I knew what he was going to say each time because he would, you know, maybe to be nice to me, I don't know, but he'd always give them the following idea. And I always wondered why this was the idea he wanted to give them. You know, you have a, your one opportunity to meet a Rosh Yeshiva. This is what he wanted to teach them. He would teach them that there were certain people who were sent away from going to war. One of them was a coward. They were a coward because and it wasn't even literal. It's because they did something wrong. What was it that they did wrong? They spoke between their shell yad and their shell rosh. This is the one idea Rav Amital would share with visiting groups to the yeshiva. And then he would go on to explain it. Now I've looked for this in writing and I haven't found it in writing. So I wrote to a group of uh, rabbinic alumni of Yeshivat Har Etzion. I'm one of the three moderators of the group. There's a couple of hundred of us. And I said, who knows the source for this? And I was given the source and much to my delight, the source where Rav Amital writes about this, he actually gives a different answer, which is even a nicer answer. So I'm going to give you two answers from Rav Amital, one which is the one I've heard him say, but isn't written down, and one which is written down, but I never heard him say. What's the one I've heard him say? Rav Amital would explain as follows. He says, you have to understand 
what the tefillin represent. And this is true whether you put on tefillin or not. Don't feel excluded if you don't put on tefillin. This applies to all of us equally. The tefillin shel rosh represent the mind, they represent intellect, they represent the service of Hashem with our knowledge and our brains. The tefillin shel yad represent the heart, because they face the heart, they represent our emotional connection to Hashem. And Rav Amital says that what are we being taught here? That it should never be a case where sach ben tefillah le tefillah, that there's a disconnect between our emotional world in the service of Hashem and our intellectual world in the service of Hashem. We need them both and they have to be connected. There are certain people whose service of Hashem is entirely intellectual. They can learn the details and they find academic interest in listening to shiurim and learning Torah. Their world is an intellectual world, but it doesn't necessarily impact their hearts and their behavior. And knowledge is not enough to impact our behavior. You can be a genius, but it's not going to impact your behavior. There are certain things in my fridge this evening, and I can give you lots of reasons why I should not eat those things in the fridge. I can give you a very convincing intellectual argument why those things I shouldn't be eating this late at night or shouldn't be eating at all. Intellectually, I definitely know the difference, what's good for me, and I know the difference between right and wrong. But if in my heart I don't feel that, then that's not necessarily going to determine how I'm going to act. Knowing the difference between what right and wrong isn't the same as feeling the difference between right and wrong. And knowing about Torah isn't the same as internalizing that and bringing that into your world of the service of Hashem. And so it's not enough to have an intellectual connection with Hashem. It has to be connected to our hearts as well. But the opposite is also true. Our service of Hashem cannot just be emotional. And it frustrates me when there are attempts to draw people closer to Judaism where there's only an emotional emphasis and there's nothing to speak to the brain at all. It can almost be emotional pornography. If somebody cries at the event, it was a successful event, and then they'll believe in Hashem. But that's not the point. It can't be purely emotional. There has to be some level of intellectual service using our brains as well. We have to serve Hashem with our bodies, serve Hashem with our hearts, and serve Hashem with our brains as well. And if we are academically challenged in the sciences, academically challenged in the way we study politics, academically challenged in the way we approach news or maths or whatever it is, we have to be academically challenged in our study of Torah and serve Hashem with our brains as well. We have to have them both and they both have to be connected. That was Rabbi Mittal's main message. But what was the one which was written down and sent to me today? It's the following understanding. in source number 14, when Rabbi Amital wrote, Tfilin shel yad hen keneged libo shel adam, the tfilin shel yad face the heart, or mechusot hen, but that is hidden. The tfilin shel yad is covered over, and it faces the heart, which is hidden. Because that corresponds to the internal truth of the individual. Tfilin shel rosh, but the tfilin which you put on your head. That is what you announce to the world. You say, look at me, I'm wearing my tfilin shel rosh. Don't I look great in these tfilin? Everybody can see them. And Rav Amital says, if Shai Pelel, you can dab and litno nev la sostinot and to do all the right movements of Allah Shailahi, the question is, im yesh tchusha amitit shel shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid, do you truly feel that Hashem is opposite you at this time? Shel amidal ifnei hakadosh baruch are you having the internal experience of connection to Hashem? Medak tekim be mitzvot, people care about the details of mitzvot. Klapei chutz hakol yafeh, and externally everything's great. Some people are sitting there learning, everything's fine. But when you're standing before Hashem, the real question is, what are you like on the inside? And therefore, Rav Amital explained, the tefillin shel rosh represent our external observance of the mitzvot. The way we advertise ourselves to the world, the tefillin shel yad represent that which is hidden, our true inner selves. And it is forbidden that there should be a disconnect between the two, 
our internal worlds should not be divorced from our external worlds. It cannot be that we go around flaunting the tefillin on our head. Look how holy we are, how externally we wear the right things and externally we make the right movements and externally we say the right things and we show ourselves in the right way externally. That has to be connected to our hearts, the tefillin shel yad, our internal word, worlds of the service of Hashem. And so if you are somebody whose intellectual world and emotional world are disconnected, or if you are somebody who on the outside pretends to be a certain kind of person, but that is not a true reflection of who you are on the inside, you are somebody who Am Yisrael can do without when they are going to war, because that's the kind of person who Hashem's not going to go out of his way to help. And therefore, there's a tremendous amount we can learn from this week's parasha, whether we are members of the IDF or not, and whether we've made Aliyah yet or not, or whether we're currently at a time of war or not. There are messages here about how we're supposed to serve Hashem, messages which we can take on in the month of Elul. We need to serve Hashem with our hearts. We need to serve Hashem with our minds. We need to serve Hashem externally. It is important to be seen to be doing the right thing. And we have to serve Hashem internally as well. And they all have to be connected and they all have to be able to inform each other so that Be'ezrat Hashem, we can come before Hashem and what he sees on the outside will be the same as what it is on the inside. Chodesh Tov to all of you. We're commencing the month of Elul. Tonight we start saying the David Hashem Ori. Tomorrow morning, if you have access to a shofar, you can hear it as well. I wish you all a Chodesh Tov and a Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov to the Rabbi. Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Chodesh Tov. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Who's this? Did you see that last message?